I was never one to believe in the supernatural, cryptids, hauntings, things that go bump in the night, none of that. I scoffed at ghost hunters, turned a blind eye to tales of Bigfoot, Loch Ness, and what have you, all of it. That is, until I came to the lake cottage. It was meant to be a month-long summer retreat, a break from the urban grind. This somewhat charming, aged lake house on the lakeside was perfect, or it seemed so. You see, the location and situation were idyllic, almost too much so. Nestled in a remote corner of the lake, the water was glassy and serene. The woods around it formed a tranquil cocoon. It was a nature lover's paradise. The only evidence that Blackthorn Lake and the lake houses existed was a sparsely detailed listing, accompanied by a rate so low that it would make a miser blush. Absurdly low. The more I looked into it, the odder it seemed. Not a single review online, and the rental fee? Well, still, my modest budget didn't allow for a second guessing. The lake house was situated on a secluded finger of the lake, a geographical anomaly making it a haven of isolation. The lake was a hidden gem itself, tucked away from prying eyes with only three houses scattered around its perimeter and a single rough dirt road winding in. It was perfect for me, I thought then. How little I knew. When I rented the lake house, I was given a set of rules. Nothing too out of the ordinary at first glance. There was to be no boating, swimming, or fishing after sundown. Certain areas were out of bounds. Particularly a promontory and a bay it seemingly guarded, located about 1,000 yards from the cottage. There was also to be no swimming at any time near the promontory or the bay. There was a midnight curfew. There was to be no littering, and there were no pets allowed. Nothing too strange, right? A little overbearing here and there, perhaps, but nothing unmanageable. And most of the things I already wasn't going to do. As I mentioned, there were only three houses on the lake. The one I would be renting, one across the lake that was owned by the owner of all three, and another house on the same side of the lake as mine, about 100 yards down. I was informed that it was being rented by a woman for the entire summer. Overall, it sounded like a great location, extremely peaceful, and I looked forward to a very nice vacation. Mid-afternoon light brushed the tranquil landscape as my car crunched up the gravel path leading towards the lake. A gentle breeze stirred the leaves of the towering pines that encircled the water like sentinels. Against the backdrop of the flawless azure sky, the lake was an enchanting mirror, reflecting the world around it. Stepping out of the car, a sense of calm washed over me as the noise of city life was replaced by nature's soundtrack. The whispering of the trees, the water lapping against the pebbled shore, the soft chirping of a distant bird. The lake stood exactly as pictured with its rugged charm. Its wide wooden deck stretched out invitingly towards the lake, promising afternoons bathed in the soft glow of the sun. Off to the side sat a modest fire pit and grill, their stones and metal having witnessed many a tale under the starlit sky. Upon crossing the threshold into the house, I was immediately taken back by its grandeur. The space opened up into a cathedral-like room with high ceilings. The bare wood walls echoed with a subtle simplicity, their grain rough and unpolished. A testament to the many seasons they had weathered. A glass wall faced the lake, the large floor-to-ceiling windows slightly tinted, softening the bright rays of the afternoon sun. A door stood in the center of them, acting as a portal between the indoors and the hypnotic tranquility of the lake. The windows on the adjacent wall looked out onto the lush expanse of the forest, offering a glimpse of the other house on this side of the lake. Opposite this wall, two doors led to the modest comforts of the bathroom and the master bedroom. 
The back of the main room transitioned smoothly into a surprisingly modern kitchen. The juxtaposition of the contemporary appliances against the rustic backdrop added an intriguing character to the place. The living area was populated by an assortment of couches, their fabrics warm but welcoming. A large TV screen perched in one corner while a wooden table demarcated the boundary between the living area and the kitchen. As I stepped back onto the deck, the stunning vista of the lake stretched out before me. Its surface, a pristine mirror reflecting the clear blue sky above, was gently disrupted by the occasional lapping of waves against the shore. The dock, worn from the whims of the seasons, reached out into the serene tableau, pointing towards the heart of the lake. The allure of the water stirred a sense of anticipation within me. I found myself envisioning lazy afternoons on that dock, fishing rod in hand, casting a line into the lake's hidden depths. The prospect of the coming days filled with the unhurried rhythm of this simple pursuit ignited a spark of excitement within me. The stage was set for my summer retreat. The understated elegance of the lake house was a fitting backdrop to the untouched beauty of the lake and its surroundings. The early afternoon sun bathed everything in a warm glow, the day promising more hours of exploration and relaxation. The sounds of footsteps on gravel pulled me away from my daydreaming. Turning, I found a man approaching, a rugged silhouette against the setting sun. His stride was steady, purposeful, like that of a man acquainted with the land. Mr. Blackhorn, I ventured, remembering the name from our correspondence. That's me. Call me Elijah. He confirmed, offering a rough hand. His features were weathered, but not unkind. His eyes had a deep gray that reminded me of storm clouds. Something about his presence, solid and unyielding as the landscape, felt as though it belonged here. We exchanged pleasantries, the typical small talk of new acquaintances. Then his gaze flicked out to the lake, a shadow of a smile on his lips. Planning on fishing? I nodded, admitting my intentions. He seemed to consider this for a moment before shrugging. Well, don't expect much. Not a lot worth catching. I felt my eyebrows raise in surprise. Really? I asked. The serenity of the lake suggested a wealth of life beneath its surface. Blackthorn merely nodded, repeating his earlier statement. Remember the rules, he added, his gaze holding mine for a moment longer than was comfortable. The sudden weight of his words hung in the air between us, a tension that had no place in the idyllic setting. I nodded again, assuring him that I understood them and would obey them. We talked for a few more minutes, not about much in particular, and then he bid me farewell. With a final lingering look back at the cottage, Elijah turned and walked away. I watched him go, the sounds of his footsteps gradually swallowed by the rustling of the wind in the trees. Left alone on the deck again, I turned back to the lake. Its tranquility and beauty a balm to the lingering unease. The afternoon was still young, the sun was high and bright in the sky, the shadows it cast long and soft over the water. As the world around me whispered with the sound of water and wind, I stood there basking in the promise of peace that the lake and its surroundings held out before me. Drawn by the prospect of solitude, I decided to venture out for a walk. The sun hung low in the sky. Its warm rays softened by the woodland canopy overhead as I traced a path leading to the other end of the lake. The trail was flanked by pines and maples, their foliage rustling with a soothing melody. I meandered alongside the lake. Through the trees, I could see it glimmering with the reflected light of the sun. As I began to approach the far end of the lake, the area began to exude a certain desolation that was unsettling, yet beguiling. It was a paradox that underlined the peculiar beauty of my summer retreat, 
something that I really couldn't understand or place my finger on. It was just a feeling that I had. I realized that I was nearing the promontory, which of course was off limits, so I decided it was time to turn back. Returning to the cottage, the notion of a peaceful evening enticed me. I sauntered out onto the deck, reclining in a chair as the late afternoon melted into early evening. The soft glow of the setting sun painted the lake in hues of gold and amber, casting long, languid shadows that danced upon the water's surface. Across the lake, I noticed a figure on a dock. It was Elijah, a silhouette against the descending dusk. He raised his hand in a casual wave. I waved back and then watched as he retreated back to his cabin. I leaned back, content in the stillness that wrapped around me, a serenity broken only by the whisper of wind through the pines and the lapping of the waves against the shore. An odd ripple appeared in the lake, breaking the tranquil surface, a strange agitation amidst the otherwise peaceful scene. Elijah's insistence on the lack of fish echoed in my thoughts as I observed the disturbance. His words stirred a curiosity in me, coaxing me to investigate the anomaly. I found myself drawn to the dock. My gaze fastened on the disturbance as the idea of fishing tomorrow began to take a strong root. Then I heard the soft padding of footsteps from behind, pulling me from my thoughts. Turning, I found a woman approaching, a dog trotting beside her. Evening, she greeted, her tone warm and friendly. Her dog, a retriever of some kind, sniffed the air, tail wagging gently. I returned the greeting and we exchanged introductions. Her name was Emma and she had arrived yesterday. Our conversation flowed from the beauty of the lake to the peculiar absence of residence. We discussed the unreliable cell service and the extremely slow internet. You know, I noted, glancing at her dog. The rules said no pets. I saw that, she confessed with a sheepish smile. After I'd already brought Daisy here. She reached down, stroking the retriever's golden coat. Blackthorn wasn't happy, but he said that we could make it work. Oh, that doesn't mean an extra fee, does it? I asked. No, she replied. He was vague about it, just weird. Weird. The word hung between us, echoing unspoken suspicions. Eventually, Emma bid me good night and ambled off with her dog. I watched them go, then turned my attention back to the lake. Another ripple broke the surface, stirring my anticipation for tomorrow's fishing. As the night enveloped the sky, I prepared dinner and enjoyed it on the deck. Down the lake towards her cabin, Emma was playing with Daisy by the water. I watched them for a moment before shifting my gaze back to the other side of the lake. Blackthorn was once again standing on his own dock, watching us. Somehow, it was an unsettling image. I watched for a moment. Eventually, Elijah noticed that I was watching and once again headed back towards his house. After a few more minutes, I retreated into the cottage. I settled with a book and I started letting the hours slip by until sleep tugged at my consciousness. Just as I was about to succumb to sleep... A dissonant noise rippled through the otherwise serene night, a subtle undercurrent of unease that jolted me awake. I sat there for a while, listening to it, trying to decide if it was just my imagination. It sounded almost like… music. It faded after a time, and I decided that it must just be the wind. Eventually, I headed to bed and drifted off to sleep. The morning greeted me with a soft, mellow light filtering through the bedroom window. I stirred, the dreams of the night receding into the recesses of my mind. It was a new day, full of the promise of relaxation and solitude. 
a perfect day to be at the lake. I decided on a morning walk. The cool breeze that rolled off the lake provided a refreshing start to the day. I ventured along the same trail as yesterday, this time with a keen sense of familiarity. There was a rhythm to the place, a quiet pulsing that had settled into my bones. As I wandered, my eyes were drawn to a peculiar sight. Embedded in the rugged bark of an old pine was a carving, primitive and crude. It was a simple, archaic symbol that seemed out of place in this tranquil setting. I brushed it off as the work of past campers, kids with too much time on their hands. The memory of yesterday's oddities resurfaced in my mind as I stared at the carving. The lake's disturbances, the ripples, the odd noises last night, the way that Elijah watched us. I shook my head, casting these thoughts away. I was here to relax after all. The thought of fishing buoyed my spirits. Maybe the mysterious, no fish worth catching lake had something to offer after all. I returned to the house and got my fishing gear, then I settled on the dock. The lake mirrored the sky, an expanse of serene blue, its surface marred only by the bobbing of my fishing float. But the fish, it seemed, were a tale for another day. Maybe Elijah was right. The rest of the day flowed by, mirroring the one before. Evening found me once again on my deck, watching the sun bleed into the horizon. Down the lake, Emma appeared, Daisy trotting along at her side. Did you have any luck with the fish? She said as she walked over, a teasing lilt in her voice. I was just giving them fair warning, I replied, playing along. A comfortable silence fell between us as we watched Daisy sniffing around. Emma broke it. Did you hear the music last night? She asked. Music? I asked, surprised. Yeah, she said, a curious frown creasing her forehead. It was faint, but it was there. It was almost like... like singing. Relief washed over me. So, it wasn't just me hearing strange things. Yeah, I, I heard it. I thought that it must have just been the wind, I replied. We exchanged theories about its origin, but ended up just shrugging it off, attributing it to the peculiarity of the place, of some natural phenomena that we weren't aware of. After a while, Emma departed with Daisy in tow, leaving me once again with my thoughts and the hum of the evening. The lake shone with its reflected light of the moon, an ethereal beauty that was slowly becoming familiar. The night was much like the one before. Once again, we were treated to a playlist of the lake's eerie serenade. The music-like noise filled the night again, reaching me through the closed windows. I stepped out onto the deck, staring out at the dark expanse of the lake. There was nothing there, just the unsettling music and the unnerving emptiness. I headed to bed, the melody of the lake following me into my dreams. My day started early, the sunrise casting its warm glow over the lake as I cast my line into the placid waters. But the fish remained elusive. My skepticism about Elijah's insistence on there being no fish worth catching waned and was replaced with a growing sense of curiosity. I had repeatedly seen disturbances at the surface of the lake, but so far nothing had shown any interest in my bait. Eventually, I retreated indoors. I decided that it was time for breakfast. The simple act of preparing breakfast provided a comforting normality amidst the peculiarities of this place. My solitude was interrupted by a knock at the door. Opening it, I found Emma, Daisy at her heels. Her face was lined with a hint of concern. Did you hear it last night? She asked, her eyes searching mine. I nodded. 
the, the singing or whatever that was, yeah. Her relief was palpable. Hey, uh, you wouldn't have some breakfast to spare, would you? She added with a light smile. I nodded and we sat down to breakfast. Our conversation revolved around the inexplicable noises. My suggestion that we involve Elijah met with a firm resistance from Emma. Her eyes darted around nervously. Elijah, he gives me the creeps, she said. After breakfast, I said that I was going to go for a walk and invited Emma along. She agreed and we ventured out, Daisy frolicking around at our feet. We took a different path this time. It led us further down the lake, the daylight casting a peaceful veil over the otherwise eerie surroundings of this trail. The day was once again serene, the sky a brilliant canvas of blue and white. Our conversation again flowed easily. It was light-hearted and revealing. Daisy ran ahead of us, her tail wagging with excitement, exploring all of the interesting smells that she had not encountered before. As we continued, the trail once again veered off towards the lake's forbidden area. This time we followed it, Emma suggesting that it might be interesting. It terminated in an old, burnt-out cabin, barely visible through the dense foliage. We paused, our jovial mood replaced by a sudden sense of unease. The mystery of the lake, it seemed, ran deeper than we had initially thought. Should we, should we go look at it? Emma asked. No, it's out on the promontory, and we, we really don't want to upset Elijah. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm really looking forward to spending at least a little bit of time here before he kicks us out. Yeah, yeah, she agreed. We decided to turn back, our walk taking a contemplative turn. We headed back down the trail to the houses. Eventually, the mood lightened again. As we neared our respective cabins, I found myself not wanting the day to end. Uh, Emma, would you like to join me for dinner? I asked, hoping that she'd accept. I'd love to, Sam, she replied, a smile warming her features. As we parted ways, a ripple on the lake's surface caught my attention. Great, now the fish decide to bite, I joked. Emma's laughter echoed behind me as I headed into the house. The afternoon was a quiet affair. My mind once again engaged in the pages of the book I'd begun earlier. As evening approached, I set about preparing dinner, the events of the day simmering in the back of my mind. Around sunset, Emma and Daisy returned. Emma was cradling a dish of something that smelled rich and savory. Daisy wagged her tail and bolted into the house. Her presence brought a sense of hominess into my borrowed residence. We shared a meal and conversation. The unease from earlier completely dissipated amidst the laughter and tales of home. Yet, as the evening wore on, our minds drifted back to the eerie nocturnal symphony of the lake. Do you think that we'll hear it again tonight? Emma asked, pushing a stray curl behind her ear. I guess we'll find out soon enough. I shrugged, trying to make light of the situation. She asked about my plans for the coming day. Well, I thought I'd give fishing another try. Would you like to join me? I asked. She nodded, her lips curving into a smile. That sounds perfect, she said. The night was still young when Emma decided to retire. I followed her out and walked her to the edge of my property, Daisy trotting ahead. A part of me lingered in their company, the isolation of the cottage suddenly more apparent. I wished them a good evening, then turned my steps towards the lake. I walked out onto the dock, the wood planks cool beneath my bare feet. The night was an entity of its own, the stars casting a silvery glow across the rippling water. The distant hoot of an owl was the only interruption to the tranquil silence. I gazed into the water, its depths dark and unknowable. 
Then I saw it. A figure seemed to surface from the lake's belly, its form vague but undeniably human. I blinked, shaking my head, but when I looked again, the water was still. The figure was gone. A shiver ran down my spine despite the warmth of the night. Must have been my imagination playing tricks on me, I told myself. Once again, unnerved, I retreated back into my house. I settled down again with my book. After about an hour of reading, my eyelids grew heavy and I went to bed. The deep quiet of the night was shattered by those sounds again. A symphony of melodies winding together to form a discordant harmony. It seemed to raise from the belly of the lake itself. A cold dread inched its way up my spine as I rose from the bed and walked to the window. I squinted, trying to pierce the darkness that blanketed the lake, trying to uncover the source of the cacophony. Out there in the murky depths, I, I thought that I saw lights, spectral hues flickering beneath the water's surface. I blinked hard, shaking my head forcing myself to rationalize the images playing tricks on my eyes. It's just the moon, I told myself. The star's reflections dancing on the lake's surface. Despite my attempts at self-reassurance, I couldn't ignore the strangeness that clung to the air. There was something wrong here, something inexplicably terrifying about the nighttime symphony the wavering lights, the feeling of being watched from beneath the water. With the sounds of the lake's nocturnal choir echoing in my ears, I climbed back into bed, my heart pounding a wild tattoo against my ribcage. Sleep seemed a distant luxury as I stared at the ceiling, the cabin too quiet in the wake of the lake's dissonant lullaby. I willed myself to close my eyes and tried to drown out the echoes of the melody still reverberating in my mind. Yet even with my eyes shut, the phantoms of the lights danced behind my eyelids, a spectral performance that added to the symphony that continued to play outside. It continued on for I don't know how long. Eventually, it faded away and I was able to get back to sleep. The following morning, as the first rays of light shimmered on the lake, Emma arrived bearing an air of normalcy in her smile. The echo of the previous night's mystery still hanging in the air. Good morning, Sam, she greeted, setting the table for our breakfast. We tucked into a hearty meal, chattering about the calmness of the morning the peacefulness of the lake. There was an ease in our conversation, a welcome escape from the surreal happenings around us. We both avoided bringing up the music, but eventually, as our breakfast was nearing its end, the haunting sounds from last night resurfaced into our conversation. We discussed how long they had lasted last night and I mentioned that I had seen lights in the water. Her face registered surprise at this, her fork pausing midway to her mouth. Lights? I didn't see any, she replied thoughtfully. We mulled over our observations of the events that had taken place, the eerie sounds, the mysterious lights, everything... Eventually, we agreed on asking Elijah about it. But our immediate agenda was different. So, I grinned, changing the topic. Fishing. Ever tried it? She admitted that she hadn't with a soft giggle that cut through the lingering tension. After cleaning up breakfast, we set off for the dock. Morning turned into afternoon as we cast our lines into the rippling lake laughter bubbling up between us despite the eerie surroundings. Our haul was modest, a handful of very small fish, 
But still, at least we had caught something, finally. Apparently, Emma was a good luck charm for me. How about fish for dinner, I proposed, considering our catch. Emma looked unsure. I wouldn't know the first thing about preparing them or cooking them, she confessed. With a comforting smile, I promised to take care of it. How about an afternoon walk, Emma suggested. Just a little one. We could head over to Elijah's house, ask him about the music. Or the noises, I suppose we should call them. I mean, it it can't be music. Well, it sounds like it, but yeah, that sounds like a good idea, I responded. We took the fishing gear back to my house and left Daisy there out of a thoughtful consideration for Elijah's dislike for dogs or pets in general. Then we embarked on our journey to Elijah's house. Elijah's house was sequestered among the trees, untouched by the cheerfulness of daylight. Its silence and the stillness of the forest around it was a stark contrast to the trail that we had just walked on. On the trail, we had seen wildlife, but as we approached Elijah's house, all of that seemed to fade away. We went to the front door, knocked, and waited, but there was no response. A sense of unease hovered around us as we ventured down to his dock. As we approached it, I noticed a strange carving on the dock post. It was the same carving I had spotted on my hike. I told Emma about it, and she suggested that we examine it on our hike the next day. I smiled. So... We're going on a hike tomorrow then. Of course, she said. Well, Elijah doesn't seem to be here and, uh, to be honest, this area is... odd. Let's head back, I said. Yeah, yeah, let's head back. So we headed back towards our lake houses. We reached mine and retrieved Daisy. Looking at the fish, I realized that I better get to preparing them. Emma headed off towards her house. As she was leaving, she turned and asked what she should bring for dinner. Surprise me, I responded. As I began the task of prepping the fish, the realness of it grounded me. As I wrestled with the scales and bones, the surreal events of the day began to fade into the background. The tantalizing aroma of freshly grilled fish filled the cottage as Emma and I sat down for dinner. Despite the lack of conversation during the meal, an amicable silence filled the room, punctuated by appreciative murmurs and laughs. These are good, Emma began, breaking the silence, her gaze on the remnants of our catch. But it's a shame they're so small. I chuckled, nodding in agreement. Maybe we'll have better luck tomorrow, I said, the prospect of our plans for the following day making the edges of my lips curl upward. Emma smiled. You know, we could take the boat at my dock out into the lake. Maybe if we went out further, we could catch bigger fish, she suggested. Well, I mean, sure, why not? Given our lackluster luck with fishing from the dock, a change of strategy seemed reasonable. Is the boat seaworthy or lakeworthy? I asked, my curiosity piqued. Emma nodded. Elijah said that it was, but I, I haven't used it yet. We resolved to inspect it later, the thought of cruising the lake in search of better fishing spots adding an exciting twist to our plans. Our conversation ebbed and flowed, the sound of our voices mixing with the evening's tranquility. Around nine, we rose from the table, ready to part ways. But before that, we had a boat to check. Walking over to her dock, the moonlight casting long shadows, we examined the old boat. It was a charming wooden vessel, painted white with flaked edges, telling stories of many summers gone by. A slight hint of dread seeped in as I envisioned us adrift on the vast expanse of the silent lake. But the palpable excitement in Emma's eyes quelled that unease. 
We lingered on the dock, drawn into an animated conversation, a sense of familiarity between us growing stronger. As the night deepened, an unspoken tension was building, accumulating in a moment when our eyes locked and the world around us seemed to pause. Then, quite suddenly, Emma leaned in and kissed me. It was quick, almost fleeting, but it left me stunned. She pulled back, her eyes twinkling in the soft moonlight, an impish grin on her face. Daisy, her faithful companion, came bounding down the dock, and with a swift, Good night, Sam, Emma ran back up the path to her house, leaving me standing on the dock, the echo of the kiss still lingering in my mind. Slowly, I made my way back to the cottage, the night's events spinning in my head, a tingling sensation still present on my lips. Later that night, as the world outside my cottage fell into an abyss of darkness and stillness, the unsettling noises returned. The otherworldly symphony, its harmony dissonant and peculiar, not like anything that I had heard before. In a way, it was beautiful, but something about it disturbed me to my very core. I found myself drawn towards the window, a morbid fascination rooting me in place. Again, I saw the lights. Undulating orbs of ethereal luminescence, they darted under the water's surface, their soft glow casting eerie shadows through the lake, conjuring monstrous shapes that played with my imagination, making my skin prickle with unease. For a moment, I contemplated venturing outside to solve the riddle of those lights and the sounds, to bring reality to the shadows and to face the dread that had steadily been brewing. But I remembered Elijah's stern warning. I remembered the rules, the curfew, and the unspoken threat beneath his calm exterior. Throughout all my time at the lake, I had seen no evidence of dangerous wildlife, no bears, no mountain lions, nothing that was really a threat. The usual inhabitants of such a wild place were conspicuously absent. That was a reality that hadn't really dawned on me until that moment. I had subconsciously noted it and had felt comforted by the fact. Now the realization, along with the rules and everything that I was seeing, it just added a gravity to the situation. The thought of stepping outside, the reality of the oppressive darkness, the rustling trees, the icy fingers of fear wrapping around my heart, they all served as a potent deterrent. Why were the rules in place? Why if there were no threats? And those threats, those dangerous animals were normal in a place like this. For them to be absent was odd. Maybe I just hadn't seen them, but what if they genuinely weren't there? If they weren't, then why weren't they? What could have driven them off? Of course, humans could have, but I really doubted that. Which meant that maybe something else had become the lake's alpha predator. All of these thoughts, my mind racing a million miles an hour, my imagination running wild. I, I had to stop. A knot of anxiety coiled in my gut. I pulled the curtains shut and I retreated into the depths of the house. The rules were there for a reason. Probably a good one, not anything sinister. For my safety. As I reminded myself of all of this, the eerie serenade of the lake played on an endless loop in the background. I felt the cold touch of the unknown of spectral figures whispering from deep within the lake. But for tonight, I chose the safety of ignorance, leaving the enigma of the lake shrouded in darkness. 
I went back to my bed, followed by the haunting symphony of the night playing until I drifted back to sleep. The dawn broke with a hush. The first rays of sunlight caressing the landscape, bathing everything in a soft, warm glow. I left my cottage, the memory of last night's eerie concert still echoing in my mind, and I headed towards Emma's place. The promise of a simple breakfast and a day spent fishing with her held a certain charm that held last night's specters at bay. As I strolled along the sandy trail, I noticed the imprints of our feet from last night. My large boots, her smaller, delicate footprints, and Daisy's paw marks trailing alongside, all leading towards Emma's cottage. I allowed myself a smile, reminiscing about the kiss, the surprise, the sweetness of the moment. Life, despite its mysteries, felt good. A few yards on, my good mood was interrupted. There, laid in the sand, were tracks that were unfamiliar. A set of strange webbed footprints, as if they belonged to some water-dwelling creature. Large and grotesque, they were out of place amidst the casual footprints that we had left. I traced their path one end disappearing into the shadowy, dense woods, the other leading back to the lake. A cold shiver trickled down my spine, a sense of dread slowly crawling into my stomach. Pushing down my unease, I continued walking, once again tracing our casual footprints, trying to recapture the joy that I'd felt just moments ago. But the tranquility was short-lived. There, a few yards later, another chilling discovery awaited me. The same set of webbed footprints, this time leading towards the lake. I followed their path, watching as they disappeared into the murky water. The promise of a beautiful day suddenly felt tarnished. The brilliant sunshine casting an unwelcome spotlight on the grotesque evidence of last night's disturbances. A creature or creatures had made these tracks, and they were no figment of my imagination. They were real, tangible, and disturbingly close. The chill of my findings hung over me like a shadow as I continued towards Emma's cottage. The air, once sweet and inviting, now held an undercurrent of menace. A sudden understanding sank into me. An understanding of what Elijah's warnings and rules may have truly been about. I arrived at Emma's place and she greeted me warmly as I walked up the wooden steps to the door. The vibrant colors of her summer dress contrasted sharply against the paleness of my own worries. She noted the crease of my brows and the tight line of my mouth. You seem upset, Sam. What's wrong? Her voice carried a hint of concern. Her brown eyes filled with a gentle empathy. I... I found something unsettling this morning. I admitted my voice low. Her brows furrowed as I shared my morning discovery. The strange, webbed tracks their odd directionality, and, of course, my growing unease. She nodded, her expression serious. Yeah, I saw the lights last night, Sam. She confessed, her gaze meeting mine. And the music? Well, it's it's all hard to ignore, isn't it? As we sat down to breakfast, an uneasy silence settled over us. Breakfast was a simple meal of eggs and toast, exactly what I had been looking forward to just a few minutes ago. A tension seemed to cling to the air, a palpable sense of dread that even the crisp morning couldn't dispel. The only beacon of warmth in the growing chill was our connection, a quiet camaraderie growing steadily in the face of the unknown. We finished up breakfast and we left Daisy at the cottage, her wagging tail and bright eyes oblivious to our unease. 
As we made our way down to the boat, the lake, now shimmering like a mirror under the morning sun, seemed to be trying its hardest to convince us that there was nothing sinister about it. We allowed it to do this. As we reached the dock, we looked at the boat again. Well, I hope it floats. Emma laughed. Yeah, yeah, actually, let me test it out first. Okay, she agreed. I got in, and thankfully, it was quite seaworthy. As it bobbed in the gentle waves, Emma got in. We cast off from the dock, the oars dipping into the lake with a soft splash. The calm beauty of the lake seemed almost surreal considering the terrors that I had felt last night. The beautiful scenery was at odds with the lurking dread that had invaded our lives. As we set out our fishing lines into the water, I couldn't help but feel the irony of our situation. Here we were, fishing in the daylight while unknown creatures possibly swam beneath our boat, the invisible predators of our worst nightmares. Our fishing was met with some success. As each catch wriggled on the end of our lines, the tension that we had felt earlier seemed to lessen. The day was bright, the air vibrant with chirping birds and the hum of summer insects. But the serenity was deceptive. Like the calm surface of the lake that concealed unknowable horrors. Emma sat beside me, her line cast into the water, her gaze fixed on the gentle ripples. Her gasp, sharp and sudden, punctuated the idyllic sounds of nature sending a shiver down my spine. What is it? I asked, looking at her wide-eyed expression. I... I thought that I saw something in the water. It, it, it looked... It, it looked human-shaped. Her voice was barely above a whisper, the color draining from her face. Memories of the shadow that I had seen earlier surfaced and I relayed my own experience to her. I was about to add more when her fishing line suddenly jerked taut. A bite! She cried out. She held on, her knuckles white against the rod, as whatever was on the other end fought back with a surprising ferocity. The reel screamed as the line was pulled out, Emma fighting to maintain her grip. I helped her, our combined efforts eventually bringing in the fish, a dark silhouette visible in the water as we heaved it in. With a final splash, the fish, a large, thrashing trout, landed in the boat. But victory was short-lived. There was a bite mark on its side. It was not the work of another fish, no. This was different. It was too large. The teeth marks uncannily human. Fresh blood still seeped from the wound. The horror of our discovery rooted us to the spot for a moment before the instinct to flee kicked in. We reeled in our lines, the forgotten trout left gasping in the boat, its wound a grim testament to our growing fear. The boat seemed to glide over the water as we rowed back with renewed urgency. The previously serene lake had once again transformed into a pool of hidden terrors. The beautiful day had lost its charm and all that remained was a bone-deep dread of the unknown entities that lurked beneath us. We didn't pull in at the dock, instead we drove the boat straight to shore. The boat crunched against the pebbly shore as we landed. We scrambled out in a haste that verged on panic. The haunting image of the mutilated fish was seared into our minds. The serenity of the day tarnished beyond repair. Our steps were hurried, the peace of the lake now replaced with an undercurrent of dread. Safely back in Emma's place, we locked the door behind us, as if that would keep the unknown terrors of the lake at bay. Our breaths were heavy and ragged, our hearts pounding like frantic drumbeats in the oppressive silence of the house. We need to... 
We need to calm down, I managed to say, leaning against the door, the cold wood biting into my back. Emma nodded, her gaze distant, her hands absently stroking Daisy, who whined anxiously. We spent a few minutes in silence, each lost in our thoughts, grappling with the reality of what we'd just witnessed. The tension gradually lessened, though it hung in the air like an unwelcome guest. After some time, I suggested, We... we should... Maybe we should go for a walk. I mean, Daisy looks restless. And we... we could use some air, couldn't we? Emma agreed, her face still pale, but determination creeping back into her eyes. All right, Emma agreed. Okay, but we should probably put the fish up first. We'll have to deal with them later, I added, gesturing towards our unfortunate catch from the lake. Emma shuddered. I'm, I'm not eating that one. No, no, me either. But the others should be fine, I said. She agreed and helped me put the fish into a cooler outside the cottage. We left the fish with the bite mark by the boat. It was a stark reminder of the unseen horrors lurking beneath the calm surface of the lake. We should, we should probably throw it back in or something, Emma said. Yeah, yeah, we should, I said as I reached to pick it up. I picked it up and threw it back into the lake. As I did so, a shiver ran down my spine. The thing was so odd, so concerning. I pushed it down and turned to face Emma. I forced a smile on my face, trying to get just a little bit of normality in the face of the abnormal. Emma tensely smiled back at me. With the image of the mutilated fish haunting our minds, Emma and I, with Daisy prancing beside us, began our walk. As we drifted down the trail, I realized that we had once again come to the forbidden area. As I gazed down the trail that led out onto the promontory, an ominous magnetism seemed to draw us forwards into the area. We paused at the path that led out onto the promontory, snaking its way past the remnants of a charred cabin and into the unnerving silence of the woods beyond. As we stood there, I looked down and my pulse quickened. Look, there are tracks. The same ones I saw earlier, I said as I pointed to the faint impressions in the muddy trail. They lead into the forest, past the cabin. We looked at each other for a moment before proceeding slowly down the path. The cabin, or what remained of it, was a skeletal, blackened structure, its charred timbers a grotesque testament to some past horror. The sight of it set our nerves on edge, the dread creeping further into our bones. This, this, this all gives me the creeps, Emma confessed, her eyes wide. I nodded. Me too. But the tracks lead past it. You think we should continue? I asked. She hesitantly nodded, and we continued our journey through the woods. The promontory was marked by an uncanny silence. The usual rustling of wildlife was conspicuously absent, much like the area around Elijah's house. As we moved deeper down the trail, Emma whispered, Are you sure we want to do this? Well, we need to know what's going on, I responded, my heart pounding. And the tracks, they lead in, but they also lead out. So whatever made them shouldn't be here. She nodded and we pressed on. The scenery morphing into an even more unsettling landscape the normality of the world left far behind. At the end of the path, nestled between two towering pines, sat a massive stone altar. It looked old, emanating an aura of ancient malevolence. Behind it, a large stone monolith stood sentinel, bearing the same strange symbol we had stumbled upon earlier. 
It was chillingly familiar, adding another layer of dread to the already frightening tableau. God, Emma whispered, her voice catching in her throat. What is this place? It was more than either of us had bargained for. A sudden instinctual fear surged within us. We turned then and fled the chilling sight. We retreated hastily to the relative safety of my cottage. Once we were safely inside, Emma and I collapsed into a couple of worn-out chairs, adrenaline still coursing through our veins. There was a silence between us, a silence filled with the palpable fear that hung heavily in the air. We need to calm down, Emma said finally, her voice shaky. I, I mean, nothing has really happened to us, right? It's, it's just creepy. I nodded, my heart still racing. Creepy, yes, but harmless? I'm not so sure. The image of the stone altar and the carved symbol refused to leave my mind. The image of the fish with the bite mark. The image of the shadow in the water, of the lights, and the music ringing in my mind. Emma bit her lip. I, I, I think I want to leave, Sam. I, I, don't, I, I don't feel safe here anymore. There was a part of me that wanted to leave too, to run away from this place and forget everything. But there was another part, a stubborn part, that yearned for answers. I, I, I know, but I want to know what's leaving those tracks. And the noises, the music, I mean, it has to be something. I attempted a grim chuckle. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Maybe it's just a cult. Emma gave me a horrified look. That's not funny, Sam. That just makes it worse. We fell into a strained silence. Emma got up and began to pace, her gaze drawn to the windows overlooking the lake. You can see where that thing came ashore from here and where it went back. She observed... I joined her at the window, staring out at the disturbed patch of sand near the water's edge. Yeah, well, I'll keep an eye out tonight, I said more to myself than her. I will too, Emma said quietly. With the decision made, we set out to fetch the fish, some dog food, and a few of Emma's things from her cottage. As we walked... The unsettling silence of the lake once again seeped into our senses. Halfway to her cottage, a disturbance rippled across the lake's surface, shattering the stillness and making our hearts race anew. Something was there, just below the surface, reminding us of the unknown horrors that we had yet to face. With Emma's help, I prepped the fish, the process offering a welcome distraction from our recent unnerving discoveries. Our laughter and conversation filled the cottage, pushing back the ever-encroaching shadows of uncertainty. Even amidst the lurking unease, the smell of fish cooking on the stove was a reassuring promise of normalcy, a testament to our persistent human capacity for finding joy and even the smallest things. We ate with an odd sense of camaraderie, our shared fear and intrigue merging into a bond stronger than the normal world would have offered. The fish was good, satisfying, a reminder that life persisted even amidst the inexplicable. After dinner, we took Daisy for a short walk outside. The dog, oblivious to our apprehensions, sniffed about the lakeside, her cheerful demeanor a balm to our frayed nerves. When we stepped back inside the lake house, we made sure that everything was secure. The windows were checked, the doors bolted, all potential entries inspected. We were as ready as we could be for whatever the night had to offer. With Daisy curled up at our feet, we settled onto the couch. Outside, the world had turned into an inky black canvas, the lake dimly reflecting the starless night. 
We watched. We waited. Two sets of eyes trained on the patch of water where the creature had emerged the night before. The eeriness of the night tinged our otherwise simple vigil with an undercurrent of dread. But for now, sitting beside Emma with the crackle of the fire and Daisy's soft snoring in the background, I felt an odd sense of calm. We were in this together, whatever this was, and that was enough for now. The grandfather clock in the corner of the room chimed, its bell tolling twelve times in quick succession. Midnight had descended upon us, and yet outside, the lake remained as still as a polished mirror, its surface untouched by any nightmarish monstrosity. As the clock stopped chiming, Emma broke the silence that settled in the room. I didn't think anything would happen yet. Not until after curfew was in place. I turned to her and I raised my eyebrows. You think that the curfew has something to do with them? Yes, she said. I think that it has everything to do with them. I think that it's there to protect them. Uh, okay, maybe. It has to be, she whispered. Yeah, I'll give you that. It, it probably has something to do with them. But I'm not sure that it's there to protect them. Yeah, she agreed. We fell into a contemplative silence, staring out at the undisturbed water. Our conversation shifted towards the oddities that had led us to this point. The rules that Blackthorn had imposed, the strange occurrences around the lake, our speculation swirling in the air around us like fog. Blackthorn must know about these things, right? Emma posited, her voice laced with a chilling certainty. I mean, how could he not, living here and renting out the cottages? Yeah, I agreed, my mind spinning with the implications. I don't see how he couldn't. But the question is, why doesn't he say anything? Why the cryptic rules and the secrecy? Emma shook her head, lost in the same maze of questions. I don't know, Sam, but we need to find out for our own sakes and for anyone else who might stumble into this place. We drifted back into silence. Vigil. The clock marched relentlessly onwards. The hands pointing at a quarter past one when Emma stirred me awake. Her grip on my arm was tight, her eyes wide and fixed on the stillness outside the window. I followed her gaze and I strained my ears. There it was, a low, sonorous rumble, a new instrument added to the orchestra we had come to expect. It merged with the harmony and melodies that had come every night before, the sounds that we had come to dread. It was a deep, thrumming sound that seemed to resonate from the belly of the lake. We watched, our breaths shallow and quick, our hearts hammering out a frantic rhythm. The room felt suddenly too small, the walls closing in around us. Outside, just beneath the surface of the lake, the lights began to emerge. They began to flicker and weave as they had the night before. Now they were multicolored and dancing under the waves like will-o'-the-wisps. They cast an eerie glow on the ripples forming on the water. Each pulse of light amplified the gnawing fear within us ratcheting the tension to unbearable levels. The surface of the lake began to roil and churn, the water bubbling and frothing like a living thing. Our eyes were fixed on the disturbance as it moved steadily towards the shore, a dark mass surfacing from the murky depths. The lights beneath the water intensified their glow illuminating the figure in a spectral array of colors. With a final surge, the figure hauled itself out of the water and onto the shore. 
The shape of it was vaguely human, but grotesquely distorted. It was shrouded in the darkness of the night, a silhouette barely visible against the moonlit backdrop. But as it began to walk, its movements disturbingly fluid, the moonlight bathed it in a cold, stark light. The sight stole the breath from my lungs. There was no denying the monstrous transformation of the figure in front of us. It was Elijah Blackthorn, the owner of the lake houses. But he was no longer fully human. Maybe he had never been. His skin was slick, reflecting the moonlight in a sheen of slimy iridescence. Gills flapped on his neck, rippling with every breath that he took. His hands, if they could be called that, were webbed, ending in sharp, talon-like claws. His legs were muscular, ending in wide, thin-like feet that made soft slapping sounds as they met the rocky shore. The most unsettling, however, were his eyes. They were large and unblinking, shining like a predator's in the night. Paralyzed by horror, we could only watch as Blackthorn moved with a hideous grace. The reality of our situation crashed down on us like a wave, a chilling understanding of the horrors that we were up against. Just as the horrifying sight of Blackthorn started to sink in, the water erupted once again. More shapes heaved themselves from the churning lake, each more monstrous than the last. These were far less human. Their bodies warped by scales and fins, gills flaring on their necks as they emerged from the water. Their eyes, too large for their skulls, glowed in the darkness a stark contrast against their grotesque, fishy bodies. But despite the horrifying mutations, there was an undeniable trace of humanity in them. Their forms were disturbingly humanoid, a nightmarish blend of man and aquatic creature. The monstrosities began to congregate, a collection of lake-born nightmares gathered by the shore. In unison, they moved with Blackthorn. They trailed behind him in a grotesque procession towards Emma's cottage. Their movements were rhythmic and eerily synchronized, like a school of fish navigating the open sea. Panic flared in Emma's eyes, mirroring the fear gripping me. What are we going to do, Sam? Her voice was barely above a whisper, the terror siphoning the strength from it. I didn't immediately answer. My gaze was fixed on the encroaching creatures. Elijah Blackthorn had reached Emma's cottage. The monsters trailing him formed a semicircle around it. Together they sang the ominous music. Elijah moved towards the door of Emma's place and the reality of the situation slammed into us. We were witnessing an unthinkable horror, one that threatened to swallow us whole. We, we need to get out of here. My voice sounded strange, distant, as if the terror had reduced it to an echo. I looked at Emma. Her face was pale, her eyes reflecting my own fear. We can't stay here, Emma. They know we're here. Sam, how? Her voice wavered, clinging to the thin thread of hope that we could escape this nightmare. There, there's too many of them, and they're everywhere out there. We have to, Em. I said. As the words left my mouth, I couldn't help but notice the glow from the lake was growing. It painted the creatures in an otherworldly light. As the light grew... The water continued to roil and churn, and more of the creatures began to emerge onto the shore. The chilling sight sent shivers down my spine, and I tightened my grip on Emma's hand. 
We watched in suspended horror as Elijah, their grim conductor, led three of the other aquatic abominations inside Emma's cottage. The grotesque procession was almost elegant in its horror. Their scales shimmered in the moonlight in an almost beautiful way. I felt a sickening lurch in my stomach as I realized that they would find Emma's absence. Emma, we have to go now. My voice was a harsh whisper, fraught with urgency. Her eyes darted from her cottage to me. A mixture of fear and resignation clouded her gaze. Daisy, she said, her voice trembling. Daisy ran to her and she lifted it into her arms. I grabbed my jacket from the back of the couch and we moved towards the front door. But we froze as we saw the monsters regrouping. Their hideous forms reflected in the window pane. They'll see us, Sam. Emma muttered, her voice echoing my own thoughts. Okay, then, then we'll go out the side, I said, motioning to the narrow door that led to the side yard. Just as we slipped out, I dared a glance back and I felt my heart plummet. The grotesque entourage was now on the move again, angling towards my cottage. Our secret was out. The race to the car was a blur. The moist grass beneath our shoes, Daisy's soft whining, and the blood pounding in my ears were all drowned out by the guttural growls and splashes coming from behind us. They were faster than I had anticipated, their misshapen forms bounding towards us with an agility that belied their monstrous features. I fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking as I unlocked the car. Emma was beside me, Daisy in her arms, her eyes wide and terrified. I pushed open the driver's door and practically threw myself inside. Emma released Daisy into the back seat before scrambling into the passenger side. The car roared to life as I slammed my foot on the accelerator. We peeled away, gravel and dirt flying up behind us. The darkened cottage receded in the rearview mirror. The creatures were mere yards away, their ghastly faces lit by the car's taillights. We sped along the desolate road that wound its way through the deep woods, and then we emerged back onto the main roads. I kept the pressure on the gas, desperate to place as many miles as I could between us and the unholy scene that we had just fled. Eventually, adrenaline began to ebb leaving in its place a sickening mix of fear and nausea. We sped down the interstate for a good long while. I don't know how far we would have gone if the fuel gauge hadn't hit empty. I took the next exit, refueled, and then, seeing the warm yellow light of a roadside motel, I headed towards it. Emma didn't protest when I pulled into the near-deserted parking lot. She just sat there, pale and shaking, clutching Daisy tightly to her chest. Inside, the motel was as expected. Tacky carpet, floral curtains, and a lingering smell of stale cigarettes and cheaper cleaning products. We got a room, and here I sit, recounting our story while it's still fresh. Daisy's curled up at my feet. Emma's finally drifted off into sleep. What do we do next? Who do we tell? Who would believe us? Tonight we'll, we'll rest. Perhaps tomorrow we'll bring new perspectives. One thing is certain though. I am compelled to offer a warning. Not just to myself, but to anyone that might hear this tale. Be cautious of lakes especially those that hide within their depths an allure that seems too good to be true. Because underneath the tranquility, there may lurk a terror that you're not ready to face. <laughs>